Jesus has forgiven you. If you're a guest with us, you may know that, you may not know that, but you're going to leave today knowing it, that Jesus has forgiven you of all of your sins. He has paid the price for all of your sins. And some of us in the room may be thinking, we may be on one side like, well, that's not too bad. I'm a pretty good person. Your your Bible says you're a sinner. And there's uh, others of us in the room who think, well, there's no way he can forgive me for all the things. He doesn't know everything. No, he knows everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done, and he has forgiven you. Jesus has forgiven you. He's paid the price for all of your sins. So we're going to start with that because as the Lord has forgiven you, from that relationship, now I am required to forgive others who have hurt me. Colossians chapter three, if you're a guest with us, I am so glad that you chose to be with us this morning. And if I didn't get a chance to meet you, I hope maybe after service can uh, shake your hand and, and welcome you officially to Boulder Mountain. We've been in a series called For All Kinds. And we're looking at what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in terms of how are we to treat all kinds of people that we interact with. And Paul in Colossians 3 is using the illustration of what we put on, put on, get dressed, wear these characteristics. And we've looked at things like compassion. We've looked at really important characteristic as a follower of Jesus. It's a required characteristic, and that is humility. We looked at patience last week. I can't tell you how many times I had this week to exhibit patience. Boy, Be careful when you pray for patience, right? Today, the passage brings us to forgiveness, to forgive one another. And we're told in this passage how we're to forgive one another. Colossians 3, verse 12, put on then, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Which one of those have you struggled with the most through this series? You don't need to answer that out loud, but you ask yourself the questions, God, where is he working on your heart? Verse 13, bearing with one another. We're told as a church, we're to bear with one another. There are times I'm to bear with you, or I'm to bear you, and you're to bear me. We're to bear with one another, to lean on one another. That's what it means to be a church. We give each other grace. There are days I need grace, and there's days you need grace. There's some days we all need grace. And what does it mean to be a, a community of followers of Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus? Oh, extend grace to one another. Bear with one another. Forgiving each other. Forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, how are we to forgive each other? How am I to forgive you? How are you to forgive me? We're told how. We're told how. And the the example is, as the Lord has forgiven you. There's a lot of wounds in this room. There's a lot of scars. There's a lot of conflict. There's conflict, I'm sure, that you've had in the past in your life. Family conflict, relationship conflict, work conflict, neighbor conflict, community conflict. Yes, even church conflict. A lot of conflict. Some of that we can look and we can praise God that through his grace and mercy, it's been resolved. It's been reconciled. And maybe you have stories you can share where you were, there was a broken relationship with a family member, with a son or a daughter or a parent. And by God's grace, there was, there's been reconciliation. There's been healing. There's many of us in the room. We can share stories where that hasn't been the end the beginning's the same. There's, there's, there was hurt. Somebody said something. Somebody did something to me. Somebody hurt me. They, they did this to me. And forgiveness has not been extended. It's not been received and it's not been given. Forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven you. This is a heavy conversation. And this is for every person in the room. No one is exempt from this conversation. For we're all to offer forgiveness because everyone in the room has been hurt. And may I say from this day forward, every one of us in the room will be hurt again. 
because you live with sinful people. You work with sinful people. Your neighbors are sinners, right? Every person you interact with, the person who's sitting in the aisle with you at church this morning is an ugly sinner, right? Before they met Jesus. Now they look a little better, okay? But none of us are exempt. This is a message for, for all of us. How are we to forgive? Bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. So the word and the verbiage here, it's a requirement. As a follower of Jesus, it's not optional. It's not if you feel like it. It's not when you feel like it to forgive. It is a requirement out of the overflow of Jesus forgiving you. Jesus has forgiven you. If you're a guest with us, you may know that. You may not know that, but you're going to leave today knowing it, that Jesus has forgiven you of all of your sins. He has paid the price for all of your sins. And some of us in the room may be thinking, we may be on one side like, well, that's not too bad. I'm a pretty good person. Your, your Bible says you're a sinner. And there's others, uh, others of us in the room who think, well, I, there's no way he can forgive me for all the things. He doesn't know everything. No, he knows everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done, and he has forgiven you. Jesus has forgiven you. He's paid the price for all of your sins. So we're going to start with that because as the Lord has forgiven you from that relationship, now I am required to forgive others who have hurt me. In our culture today, there's, so, there's a few options, right? In our culture today, kind of crazy, the culture in which we live, because we either, I either withdraw myself. I'm just going to run away. Somebody hurt me. I'm going to run away. I'm going to block them. Right? Phones and emails, and I'm going to go a different direction. I'm never going to run into them. Again. I'm going to withdraw myself. The word cancel has shown up here now in our culture. I'm going to cancel them. Never going to give them an opportunity to speak to me, to say anything to me. I'm never going to see them again. I'm going to cancel them. So I can withdraw. I can run away. I can cancel. And the other option, you, which is actually celebrated in our culture, is you get revenge. Stand up for yourself. You go after them. Don't let them treat you that way. Go after them. Get angry. Which one do you tend to do? Which one is most natural to you? These are, are common cultural responses to conflict. It happens all the time. It happens even in the church. Right? I'm going to run away. I'm going to cancel you. I'm going to block you. You said this to me. And what are the reasons that we give? Well, you don't know what they've said. You don't know how they treated me. You don't know what they've done. They don't deserve it. And we flip it and we ask ourselves, did I deserve the grace and the forgiveness that Jesus has offered me? And the answer is no. Jesus has forgiven me for all my sins in the past, for my sins today and my sins in the future. And he's done the same for you. Forgiveness is attitudinal. Forgiveness is a decision made within the heart of an individual to forgive another person. It only requires one party for forgiveness to be offered. This is a common misconception that there requires two willing parties for forgiveness to be offered. No. Reconciliation, yes. For reconciliation to occur, there needs to be two willing parties. And it requires humility among both parties. But for forgiveness to be extended, only requires one person. It only requires one person to, to say, to have the composure and the posture and the attitude to say, I choose to forgive you. What is forgiveness? It is a voluntary suffering. It's choosing to suffer voluntarily when I say I choose to forgive you. What are you sacrificing and what are you suffering from? Human nature says, I want to get even. I want revenge. I want to lord it over them. I want to remind them of this from the day, from today until they die. There are things in this room that have happened 20, 25, 30 years ago that we still hold on to. And we bring it up when we go back for family reunions. And to forgive means 
to, I'm going to voluntarily lay down my right to ever bring it up to you again. I'm never going to lord it over you. I'm not going to use it to mock you, to abuse you, to remind you. Why? Because that is how God has forgiven you and forgiven me. He never brings up our sin to us once it's forgiven. He has forgotten it as far as the east is from the west, as far as the, the sea is deep. That's how far God has removed your sin. He remembers it no more. He will never use it against you. Anytime you are reminded of that, that is of the enemy who brings it up to your mind and wants to tell you how bad of a person that you are. That is of the enemy. That is not of God. So how are we to forgive others as God has forgiven me? What does forgiveness look like? As God has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You, I see it's sometimes a habit now. I read stories, news articles, and I see examples of apologies. I don't know if the last apology from politicians and athletes and where they are forced to make an apology, and you, you see different prepositions used. I am sorry, but... And then they go on to give their reason why they're sorry, right? That's not a true apology. Or maybe this is shared in your marriage or among kids. I'm sorry if that's not an apology. I'm sorry if you feel that way, right? You are removing all responsibility from yourself. I'm sorry you feel that way, but you're putting it all on that person. That's your, that's your issue. I'm sorry, but now I'm going to give you all the reasons why I did what I did. I'm sorry I hurt you. And here's how I hurt you. Here's the pain that I extended to you. Here's, here's how I made your life more difficult. I own that 100%, and I am truly sorry. And then it doesn't end there, my friends. As a church, let's be a church that is willing to offer forgiveness. What does it mean to truly offer forgiveness? To say, do and ask the question. Don't, don't run out of that conversation until you ask the question. Do you forgive me? Do you forgive me? And to say, I forgive you means somebody has to pay the cost for, for our relationship with our heavenly father. Jesus paid the cost. Somebody has to pay the price for sin. The gospel is not just that God loves you. He's going to look the other way on your sin. It's okay. Don't worry about it. No big deal. No, it's penal substitution. It's, it's justice and unconditional love coming together at the very same time. God doesn't overlook our sin. He pays the price because he is a perfect judge. And that sin, there has to be a price for your sin and my sin. There's a price to be paid for sin. We live in our culture where everything is permissible, right? But nothing is forgivable. In our culture today, let me repeat that. Everything's permissible, but nothing's forgivable. And the church, the church should be a place where forgiveness is extended. We receive it, and as we receive it, let's extend it. Let's give it. Let's give it away. So what does it mean for me to say, I forgive you? It means I'm going to pay the price. And that price, it's hurt. It hurts, and it's not natural to any one of us in the room. Because, listen, for true forgiveness comes before the feeling. I believe it's an intentional decision before you feel like forgiving someone. If you wait, if you and I wait until... We feel like forgiving someone. You know what will happen? We'll never forgive somebody. Now, maybe the feeling will come on down the road with reconciliation, but forgiveness is a heart decision. And if truth be told, it's really more for you than it is even for the other person. When do you forgive? You forgive as soon as possible. Do they have to ask for forgiveness before I forgive? No. No. They may not even know they did anything wrong. The choice for you to forgive is your choice. It's your decision. It, it's from your heart. And there's some, there's different levels of hurt and pain in our life. And some of those, it may not be wise to ever seek reconciliation with another person. I just want to make that clear. There's maybe some really hurtful things that have happened to you. Maybe some abuse situations. It would not be wise for you to go and sit face to face with that person. I would say seek professional help and seek godly counsel when it comes to things like that. But for most of our conflict, most of the time, it can be a decision made within our heart. And it's, it needs to happen even before the hurt happens. You're like, what are you, what are you talking about? As a brother and a sister in Christ, we're, we're quote unquote family. We are the body of Christ. 
there needs to be a relationship that we have with each other where when hurt is extended, I'm, I'm going to offer forgiveness. And we have that type of relationship. I am going, I have this posture. I know you're going to hurt me. Anybody who's married in the room, there will be days your spouse will hurt you. It's, it's going to happen, right? Throughout our 27, 28 years of marriage, I'm sure 10,000 times there's been conflict between us, right? How many times is my wife to forgive me? Unlimited. Unlimited. Peter, he's like, hey, there's got to be a limit here. So he asked Jesus, hey, how many times am I supposed to forgive my brother? Unlimited. His answer was as, as many times as it takes. Now, forgiveness, it's, it's a choice made. It's a decision made. It comes from the heart. I choose to forgive you. I'm, I'm not going, I forgive you means I will never lord this over you again. I will never remind you of this ever again. I don't think humanly will ever forget. So don't say I forgive you if you haven't made that decision in your heart. And it brings, it's, there's peace. And our prayer is that that forgiveness then would lead to reconciliation. Reconciliation does require two parties. Forgiveness requires one party. Let me bring you to two, two stories in Luke. The gospel of Luke, who is our most de detailed account writer within the Gospels. He was a doctor. He, he focused on all the details. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. You can listen along or you can turn there in your Bibles. On one of those days as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was with them to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed and they were seeking to bring him and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. How do you know when you're really having church, people start dropping through the ceiling, right? So they start coming through the ceiling. When he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question him. Did the man ever ask, according to Luke, who's a very detailed account writer, did he ever ask, Jesus, forgive me of my sins? No. There's story after story after story where Jesus forgives, where they never asked. There, there's a belief that says you, you don't get forgiveness unless you ask. Unless you go and you get on your knees and you beg for forgiveness. And then maybe if you're lucky, somebody will offer you forgiveness. That is not the picture we have of Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus says, I, I see. I see your faith. Your sins are forgiven. Now, prior to this, for hundreds and hundreds of years, there was a very strict process in order to find forgiveness. There was a location you had to go to. There was a person you had to go to. You had to go through a priest. And you had to do all the ceremonial cleansing in order for forgiveness to be granted. So Jesus is flipping everything upside down. And then they begin, scribes and Pharisees begin to question saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to rise up and walk? That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what had been lying on, and he went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they were glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things here today. What is more difficult to say, get up and walk to a paralytic, or to say your sins are forgiven? Your sins are forgiven. The amazement in this room wasn't just that a paralyzed man started to walk. It was that his sins were forgiven. Jesus healed somebody who could not pay him back in any way. He, there was nothing this man could do to even, even ask for it. He couldn't even walk. He couldn't even get there. He relied on his friends to bring him there. Boy, it would be great if, if we all had friends like that, right? He'd do anything it takes to get them to hear the good news of the gospel. I'll take them anywhere. I'll put them on anything. I'll get them there. I want them to hear the good news. 
And he heard the good news and he got up and he walked. I believe he became a, we don't know this. Just want to clarify. This is, this is Kyle's imagination. I believe he became an evangelist. Let me tell you about the man I met who said my sins were forgiven. Oh, yes, by the way, I can walk. But what's greater than that, he said to me, my sins are forgiven before I even asked. Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Let me summarize the story. He goes over to Simon's house. This house is packed. And the windows, they didn't have screens and glass windows back then. The windows were open air. And so people crowded around the windows and they put their elbows on the windows to hear. They pushed their ear into the room. They could hear Jesus. And there was a woman there in this room. Luke chapter 7, verses 36. When the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, Simon, he went into the Pharisee's house and he reclined at a table. Behold, a woman of the city, we don't even know her name. A woman of the city who was a sinner. What did we know about her? We don't know her name, but we know that she was a sinner. We can all relate to this woman. When she learned that he was reclining at a table in a Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet from her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, you might have missed this. She's behind him. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when Jesus reclined, when the disciples reclined at the Passover, they're actually laying down. He's on his elbow. They're eating with their right hand. They're laying down. They're not sitting in chairs like you and I would do. And so when you wash somebody's feet, you're actually washing from behind. She is behind him as his feet are reclined out. That is the picture happening in this room. Now, when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, they said to them, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman who this is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Yes, teacher. Does he really know my thoughts? Did he really realize what I was thinking just at that moment? And so he goes and he tells a story. There's a money lender who had, who had two borrowers who couldn't pay their debt. One had 500, owed him 500 denarii, and the other owed him 50 denarii. 50 denarii is about a month and a half's wages. 500 denarii is about a year and a half of wages. They both owed this lender money, and he realized that they couldn't pay it back. And so he says to both of them, the one who owed 50 and the one who owed 500, you're forgiven. Your debt is canceled. Your debt is, your debt is paid for. He asks this question. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, and Jesus looks at him. Maybe he smiles a little bit. He says, you are correct. And Simon's like, whew. He's got a whole crowd of people there, right? It's kind of embarrassing if he had the wrong answer on that one. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, turning toward the woman, he's going to speak to Simon, but he's looking at the woman. Luke is so specific with his details. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? He is looking at the woman. We don't know her name. Room full of scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders. And this woman snuck through the crowd. Maybe she crawled on the floor and she got to Jesus. Do you see this woman? I entered your house, Simon. And when I came in the house, you didn't offer me anything. You didn't offer to a bottle of water. You didn't offer to clean my feet. You didn't, you didn't offer me anything. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you her sins, which are many, she is still looking at this woman. He is still looking at this woman. Her sins, which are many, he does not let her off. Right? What's she, what's he saying? She is guilty. She is full of sin. She's a sinner. Therefore, I tell her, tell you, for she loved much, but he is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who are at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Did she ever ask? 
for forgiveness according to the tax? No. It is not a requirement that somebody comes and asks for forgiveness for you to forgive them. You and I have an opportunity to offer forgiveness by with a decision made within our heart. And for those of us who recognize the magnitude and the gravity of our sin, we recognize the greatness and the goodness of the grace of God even so much more. For those who have been forgiven much, we recognize how much God loves us. And our worship flows out of that. This morning, as we sing, as we worship, it's a room full of sinners who recognize we have been redeemed and we have been bought back. We recognize that we have sinned much. And as a result, we've been forgiven much. And so how are we to forgive as the Lord has forgiven you? And I've been guilty at times of receiving the grace and the mercy of God and receiving the forgiveness and then not being willing to extend that to another person. Have you? What would it look like if there was a room, if there's a church full of people who sought forgiveness? Some of us in the room, we need to receive forgiveness. Some of us in the room, we need to extend forgiveness. And then you trust that God would work out the reconciliation. That doesn't, that doesn't always happen. Forgiveness is granted before it is felt. A society, here's what I've, what I've recognized and what we've all recognized, a society or a marriage or parenting without prepaid forgiveness is a society on the verge of civil war. If we are waiting for one small act before we blow up at each other, and we are on the verge of civil war. We're on the verge of civil war in our marriage. We're on the verge of civil war between parents and children. If we do not learn to live with prepaid forgiveness, grace covers a multitude of sins. There are things and there are hurts that happen every day. Ask yourself, was this intentional? Probably wasn't intentional. Was this even an accident? It might have been an accident. Are they even aware? They may not even be aware. What does it look like to live, live at peace? The final passage in Luke, Luke chapter 23, there's a passage. It's one of the final words that Jesus has on the cross. And for any of us who think, no, there has to be repentance before forgiveness can be received. Jesus on the cross says, father, forgive them. Luke 23, verse 34 he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. As they are actively crucifying him and mocking him and ridiculing him and punishing him, he says to his father, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. What would it look like for you and I to have that mentality, to make that decision to offer forgiveness? I know this is a really heavy topic to cover in one message. This could be a whole series. And I would encourage you to take the next step, whatever you feel like the Holy Spirit is, is calling you to do, to do that, to offer and extend forgiveness really sets you free. It's been said, maybe you've heard this quote, is not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. You are the one who suffers from the lack of forgiveness being extended. There is a direct link, medical research shows, there's a direct link between holding bitterness in your heart and anger and heart disease upon the body. Offering forgiveness is a benefit to both parties. And for some of us, there may be people who've hurt us years ago who no longer are living. You, you can still in your heart choose to forgive that person. Some of us, you're so distant from another person that what's required is writing a letter, sharing that. Some of us need to humbly go before another person and, and make that connection as soon as possible because so many years have been wasted and lost. Extend that and say, hey, I hurt you a number of years ago. This is how I hurt you. Do you forgive me? And when you've already made that decision, you're like, when do I forgive as soon as possible? Well, who goes first? Here's the answer. You. Who goes first? Am I supposed to wait for them? 
No, you go first. Forgive others as the Lord has forgiven you. And I ask myself, how dare you, Kyle, receive the forgiveness and grace, unconditional love of Jesus and not be willing to extend that same forgiveness to another person? What does this look like in your life? What does it look like to say, I forgive you? And maybe for some of us, for the first time today, we're hearing what it means to truly forgive. It means the debt has been paid. It's been canceled. And Jesus has, has done that for each and every one of us today. But God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not once we got clean, he died for us. Not he reconciled us to him once we started looking a little bit better and changing our behavior. No, while we were at our very worst, that's when he died for us. And before we can extend forgiveness, some of us in the room, maybe today for the very first time, you need to receive the forgiveness that God offers you. Philip Yancey, who's one of my favorite authors, he wrote a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. He says this, God took a great risk by announcing forgiveness in advance. You think about that. There's a risk there. But what if? But what if they don't change? What if they keep doing it over and over? God took a great risk by announcing forgiveness in advance. And here's what God did. He left us the freedom to either accept it or reject it. My friends, your sins have been forgiven. You have a choice to either accept that or reject it. The choice is yours. A, a prayer is going to come on the screen here today. And if you've never said yes to Jesus, I'm going to give you a chance just to say this simple prayer. There's nothing special about this prayer. When you talk to God, it can be in your own words. But here's the prayer. It's there up on the screen. It says, Heavenly Father, let's just all say this together. For some of us, we need to be reminded of this. Let's say it all together. Heavenly Father. I am like the man on the mat. I am like the woman at the banquet. I need to be forgiven of my sin. I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. I believe Jesus earned it for me when he died for me. So I place my faith in him as my forgiver and savior. Amen and amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this example you have provided for each and every one of us of unconditional forgiveness. Thank you that you have forgiven us of our sin. It is up to us to receive that, to accept it. We can't do anything to earn it. Father, for this topic, as we discuss, there is hurt in this room. There are scars in this room that go so very deep. We are holding on to things that have happened to us, uh, to us, uh, about us, have been said about us for years. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would have the courage to do what you are asking us to do. We would have the wisdom to know what you're asking us to do. We'd have the courage to do it. We would have the humility to raise our hands and say, hey, I need help in this area. I need professional help. I need to speak to somebody. This is so difficult and this is so painful. But forgiveness is offered to us for our own benefit and for our own peace. And Father, for forgiveness that has been extended, that we would never bring it up. We would not use that. Some of us are using things that happened years ago as a weapon, as a tool. We keep, we keep bringing it up and using it against other people. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that that would be removed. That would be laid down. And we'd offer forgiveness in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.